earlier we saw the diplomatic overtures the Obama administration made when it took office. Today, we can see how those policies played out. The president had promised a diplomatic reset with Russia, even scrapping a missile defense system in Europe as a conciliatory gesture. And after his re-election, he pulled America's main battle tanks out of Germany, tanks that had been there since World War II. All eyes were on Vladimir Putin to see how he'd respond. And in February 2014, Putin sent in troops to seize Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula. In Europe, we envision a, a different kind of relationship than what has actually emerged. We didn't anticipate uh, that Russia would uh, illegally annex Crimea. We didn't see that kind of destabilizing activity. Next, Putin's forces began menacing Ukraine itself. The fundamental point in dealing with a bully like Putin is that you cannot allow bullies to get away with what they want to do. But the president rejected calls for a muscular response, instead announcing limited sanctions. I believe there's still a path to resolve this situation diplomatically in a way that addresses the interests of both Russia and Ukraine. I think the president should have taken some, some very strong steps to make very clear to Putin that this was unacceptable. He should have provided arms to the Ukrainians. But he didn't. And today, Russia is emboldened, threatening to spread its sphere of influence even wider. Secretaries Panetta and Gates and others uh, told us that you can let bullies get away with bullying or you pay a price. I was talking about Ukraine with the president, and he told me very bluntly that Ukraine, as a non-NATO country living in the shadow of Russia, will always be subject to Russian meddling and domination. And so what he's doing there is basically signaling that this is not worth United States investment. Then there were Barack Obama's overtures to the Muslim world, where he hoped to change the image of America. He had pulled American troops out of Iraq without a stay-behind force that had been recommended by his military advisors. But without a U.S. presence, violence immediately returned across the country. Neil Ferguson a professor of history at Harvard University remembers talking to veterans of the war. They had turned it around. To be told the mission was being aborted must have been a shattering blow. The Iraqis, of course, couldn't leave. Some found another cause. Many of them wound up eventually uh, working with ISIS to uh, create the force that ultimately uh, came back uh, and invaded uh, that, that part of Iraq. Uh, that uh, they help and hold today. In Egypt, President Obama had supported the overthrow of America-leaning Hosni Mubarak, and his administration applauded when a new president was elected, the Muslim Brotherhood's Mohamed Morsi. I have come to Alexandria to reaffirm the strong support of the United States for the Egyptian people and for your democratic future. Well, this was hilariously wrong uh, in the Egyptian case because uh, the Muslim Brotherhood had turned out to be the most extreme group capable of winning large numbers of votes. Once in office, Morsi granted himself unlimited powers and imposed a constitution based on Sharia law. Egypt, the administration seemed to welcome the ouster of uh, Mubarak yeah. and Morsi. Egypt was a classic case of you know, hope, hope and change not actually coming to fruition. Egypt descended into chaos. Morsi, in turn, was overthrown in a coup. <laughs> Libya had been the one nation where President Obama was willing to take action with an intervention supported by the UN. Soon, dictator Omar Gaddafi was gone, which only led to the question, what happens next? What happened next was Libya fell into chaos, a fact brought home tragically by an attack in Benghazi, which killed four Americans, including Ambassador Chris Stevens. Soon, warring factions, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda, 
were fighting for power. It was a complete mistake to go into Libya. I was in a key job in the administration, and I can't sit here and tell you what was our, what were our goals for that operation. I, I have I really don't know to eliminate Gaddafi. That was a severely dumb decision. He said very bluntly to me about the Libya intervention, quote, it didn't work. Wasn't he warned by people like Secretary Gates about Libya's tribal history and the dangers of taking out Gaddafi? There was a huge fight in the administration. Turns out that the Gates side was right, but I think Obama now is on the side of, you know what, I should not have let myself be pressured into this intervention. And that profoundly influenced the way he dealt with Syria the next couple of years. Syria, you'll recall, is where President Obama drew a red line and then it was crossed. The president and his advisors agreed on an attack plan, but he pulled back at the last moment. I use the term stunned because I, I was stunned by that. Chuck Hagel served as President Obama's Secretary of Defense from 2013 to 2015. It reversed a very comprehensive, complete decision that had just been made a few hours prior to that. And the president had made the final decision, and a few hours later, we're pulling that down, we're reversing that. Secretary Hagel told us the president's decision damaged America's credibility. It was all over the world, and our allies would ask me, uh, how can we uh, have confidence in whatever else he says? It's an old principle that the president should be very careful about uh, drawing lines. But once he drew that line, then the United States is obligated to enforce that, uh, that red line. For a lot of people in Washington and a bunch of other places around the world, this was a weak moment for the United States, a weak moment in his presidency. What he told me was not only was it not a weak moment, it was a, quote, proud moment for him because it's the moment that he broke with the Washington playbook. So he doesn't see it as weakness at all. He sees it as a moment of great prudence. He sees it as the application of smarts. He does not see it as, as weakness, he sees it as strength. But if it was a proud moment, others ask, what has it produced? In the end, what do you have? You, you have a Middle East that will be devastated, um, more suffering, more killing, more distrust, more hatred. And so the man who presented himself as the man of peace has actually presided over much more violence in the Muslim world than happened under his, his predecessor.